this might be my most controversial video yet. I want to talk about who deserves the credit. That's right, my erudite friends, we are going to be discussing the dicey world of magic crediting. Who came up with what? What should be attributed? How high should our standard be? By the end of this episode, I'm going to share some names with you about people who I think are doing a great job of crediting and some authors who just, well, aren't. In fact, one could argue, as has been done, that when someone doesn't do a good job of crediting, they are, in fact, stealing from other creators. At this point, you could be asking yourself, why should I care about any of this? After all, there is that famous quote from Ronald Reagan about credit. On my desk in the Oval Office, I have a little sign that says, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. But he wasn't a magician. Crediting, or a lack thereof as the case may be, is responsible for some of the biggest fights in the world of magic. Knowing and understanding about crediting is part of being an erudite magician, so I think it's an important topic that we should dive into. This episode of Erudite Magic is being brought to you by Don's Magic and Books, who wants you to have access to an even bigger library to do your research so that you can determine crediting. What I'm really trying to say is that Don offers a lot of books at tremendous prices, so if you're looking for books to add to your resource library, you can do so at his website, donsmagicandbooks.com. This week, if you apply the code CREDIT, at checkout, you'll save 10% off the already remarkably low prices. I love seeing how many magicians are going over there and finding some great deals on books, DVDs, tricks, and props at Don's website. So many of you have reached out to tell me that you're taking advantage of these deals, and I'm happy to know that this is helping you out in some small way to continue your magic education. Of course, Don offers a full refund of your shipping if you purchase $20 or more of media items shipped in the United States, and if you're an international customer, he offers an option to find out exactly how much shipping will cost to your location. Be sure to check Don's website regularly because he's constantly adding things, and some some of these items are fairly limited in quantity because they are out of print, so I hope you're able to find that special book that you've been wanting to add to your shelves. Back to the discussion. Being a student of magic means caring about the origins of plots, moves, and presentations in this world. Knowing our history and being able to stand up for the creators is essential. After all, credit in the world of magic especially, is a type of currency, if you will. It's the grease that keeps the wheels turning. From everything I understand, there isn't a whole lot of money in the world of magic publishing. So it becomes vitally important to give people the proper credit they deserve when they share a new magic idea with us in the magic community. Because ultimately, I feel that that's one of the most unique things about the world of magic that just makes it so awesome. It's this community that is always advancing the ball, always taking an idea and pushing it further and further and further. We're constantly standing on the shoulders of giants. And when we don't show proper attribution for moves, plots, presentations, and patter, we disrespect the very source of where our magic comes from, and we jeopardize quenching the fire that makes magic burn so brightly. But not only is crediting an encouragement to the creators who are so generously sharing, it also helps us to advance the art because using a common name and understanding the source of where a move came from just advances the ball. It elevates the art. Jargon helps us advance faster by using common names for certain moves. I mean, can you imagine if an Elmsley Count wasn't known as that and it was always being reinvented or referred to as a different name? You'd have to describe it in every book that talks about this. So while books would be a lot thicker, there really wouldn't be any more value to those books. It's way better to be able to reference a move by the originators, the name that they gave to it. Although in this case, that's a weird example because the Ghost Count is what Elmsley called it and now we call it the Elmsley count, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Now, jargon does create a bit of a barrier to entry because when you're first starting out in magic, there's a high likelihood that you don't understand all of these references and names. I remember when I was first starting out and I started to read periodicals, it was like looking through kind of a foggy piece of glass. I knew what I was reading, I knew what I was seeing, but I didn't completely understand it in a crystal clear sort of way. Your experience might be similar. 
However, I found that after a few years of studying the classics and reading magic books and applying myself, I went back to those same periodicals I was reading and I found that I understood them so much better. And that's the way it is for magicians, that as we learn to credit and to understand the sources of where things came from, to know what an Elmsley count is, to talk about a Browie add-on, a retention vanish, a top palm, a double undercut, you get the picture. All of these terms are jargon that the average person wouldn't understand, but as we get into crediting and understanding the rich history of magic, it helps us to advance faster because now we can use terminology and shortcuts or technology, if you will, that will help the educated and those on the inside to advance even faster. On the flip side of this, when people don't do a good job of crediting, it reminds me of Barry Bonds in the MLB. Sure, Barry Bonds is a very controversial figure because we all know that he used steroids. We also all know that he holds the home run record. But every time his name comes up, it seems like there's a tremendous amount of controversy surrounding his record. Does he deserve it? Is he really the home run king? Did he cheat to get there? There's always going to be that little asterisk next to his name whenever he comes up in conversation. It's the same thing in magic. If someone doesn't do a really great job of being rigorous in their crediting, and I believe that it's always on the publisher or creator, the person putting out the book, to do that research. It's not good enough to say you just weren't aware or publishing it and waiting to see if someone comes back and says, hey, you know, that's already been in print or you took this person's presentation. No, if something is worth printing, it's worth doing it right the first time. And I understand mistakes can be made, but if we don't hold ourselves to a high standard, then aren't we really condoning that it's okay to put out sloppy material? Basically, if you're in too big of a hurry to publish something without doing your due diligence, then you're probably not ready to publish. I said I was going to name some names, and so I want to share with you some people that I think did an incredible job of crediting through everything that I've seen. No one's perfect. I think that everyone has made an honest mistake, but it really becomes whether you are known for being a good creditor or if you're known for not being such a good creditor. Anyway, I think that Simon Aronson was always one of the best creditors out there. His work almost bordered on the academic with how thorough it was in his research and write-ups. Frankly, his thoroughness is one of the reasons I have such a high degree of respect for his writings and his creations. Personally, I've also found that Nick Trost always did a good job. Many times he was borrowing from other creators by taking something they made, whether it was a plot or a presentation, and changing it by using a subtlety instead of a slight or finding an easier way to do the slight. But he almost always credited where he read the original and how his version differed in some way. I've also always found that John Bannon's work does a great job of explaining where the original concept came from and how he has iterated it or where you can find more about the original. Modern publications, I think, are sometimes a 50-50. Overall, I believe that the magic book world has advanced. We as erudite magicians and magic consumers have demanded a higher standard for the most part from authors. That being said, though, with the ease of ebook publishing and people being able to self publish books, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. However, one of my favorite contemporary works on the subject of good crediting is Florian Severin's What Lies Inside. I've talked about this before, but this crediting in his book is just absolutely amazing. He not only attributes moves and plots and presentations to their original authors, he also gives you an extended list of other reading that might be ancillary to what he's talking about, but has influenced him in some way. And some of those credits are from the non-magic world. He's done one of the best jobs I've ever seen of crediting everyone that could have possibly influenced his thinking and given you another place to go look for things. On the flip side, I've had a little bit of an up and down relationship with some of Harry Lorraine's publications. If you've been in magic for any length of time, it's probably not surprising that I'm bringing up his name. It's often been mired in some controversy. And I want to be clear that I'm not disrespecting what he's done for the magic community. I still love and perform a lot of the material that he has. 
I'm just not always sure that it's his own creation. There are several examples from his works that I could point to specifically that have been in print in some older books, Rufus Steele, Greater Magic, etc., that Harry published without attribution and in some cases published claiming the credit for himself. I'm not here to bash Harry Lorraine. I'm just pointing out that with each time he's published something that has been in print before and he didn't give any attribution, it has led me to add another little asterisk next to his name on all the things that he did publish. Let's not belabor the point here. I love all these authors. I read their stuff. I perform their stuff. I'm really not intending to bash anyone. I'm just saying there's room for improvement. So what can you do to help make magic crediting better? One is I believe that you can educate yourself. Read the classics. Study the rich history of magic. And when you learn something, commit to understand who came up with it and what the origins of that move are. Are. And when you do get educated, you can help the community at large by sharing what you've learned with others. So when you're sitting at a table sessioning with someone and you see a move, give an attribution. Mention that you know where that came from or ask the table if they know. And almost as importantly, when you see something misattributed or not attributed at all, you should speak up. Let's give proper credit to the creators who have so generously shared their work with all of us. Don't be afraid to apply the golden rule. How would you feel if you were the creator and something you put out in the world was being misattributed or not given credit at all? Look, I genuinely believe that most magicians care about giving proper credit. And we've become so much better at doing it with the tools that are available to us, Dennis Bear's Conjuring Archive, and the widespread availability of communication tools like email, Zoom, etc. We have access to people who know or resources that can help us in our research. A few weeks ago, I interviewed Harapan Ong, and if you haven't seen that interview, you might want to check it out. But he has published a PDF book on the subject of crediting, which establishes some great ground rules and criteria for what should be credited. So if you're interested in learning more about this topic and continuing the discussion, I highly recommend you download it. By the way, it is completely free, so I'm going to drop a link down in the description below so that you can download it and we can continue this conversation here in the comments or on my community page. If you want to know how you can keep track of what you're learning and how you can remember more of what you're reading, check out this video on how to use journaling as a tool to help. As always, my friends, I appreciate you watching. And until next time, keep reading.